Hi, today we are going to talk about friction. Among our goals for this session, we're going to look at how we handle friction. It's really using a very simple model. We're going to distinguish between what we call kinetic friction, friction associated with one object moving on another, and static friction, that's friction associated with an object at rest with respect to another one. And we'll also look at the effect of contact area in our simple model of friction. So we get friction when objects are in contact. So there is a contact force that exerts, exists between objects in contact. The normal force is perpendicular to this interface between the objects. The frictional force is the other component of the contact force and it acts parallel to the interface between objects. Often people think that friction just opposes motion. What it really does is it opposes any relative motion between objects. This word relative is a very important word. If there is relative motion, then the frictional force is the kinetic force of friction. So if two objects are in contact with one another and they are moving with respect to each other, then that's the kinetic force of friction that's involved if there's a friction force. If there's no relative motion, the frictional force is the static force of friction. So the two objects are in contact. They're not moving with respect to one another. They could both be moving together, for instance, but if they're not moving with respect to one another, then we have a static force of friction acting, if there is a friction force at all. Okay, so let's talk about kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is actually a little bit easier to deal with than static friction. So let's say I push a book, you push a book across the table. So after you let it go, what happens is the book generally slows down and then comes to rest and it's a friction force that slows the book down. This is the kinetic force of friction because the book is moving with respect to the tabletop and the kinetic force of friction simply opposes the motion. Okay, So the book sliding to the right, the friction force acts to the left. So here for instance is a book or an object that was is sitting on some other object, sitting on a table or on the floor so when it's at rest, we simply have an upward normal force balancing a downward force of gravity. The upward normal is applied on the book by the table, for instance. The downward force of gravity is applied by the earth on the book. If we now set this object into motion to the right, then we have a kinetic force of friction acting to the left, and that would act to slow the object down. And if it comes to rest, then the friction force goes away. So this is our, really our simple model here, that the friction force is proportional to the normal force. Okay, so the friction force Fk, kinetic force of friction, is equal to some number we call mu k, that's the coefficient of kinetic friction, times the normal force. So this thing mu k, mu is the Greek letter uh, mu here. It uh, doesn't have any dimensions at all. Okay, so on the left of our fk equals mu k fn equation, we have a force. So we have force units on the left. fn already has force units all by itself. So this thing mu k doesn't have any units. It's actually the ratio of fk to fn. And it depends on the two surfaces that are in contact. Okay, so if you have, for instance, steel on wood, okay, there's a particular coefficient of friction or a range of coefficients of friction that apply to that particular case. If you have rubber on wood, you'd get completely different values of coefficients of friction, for instance. So typical values might be uh, in between 0 0.1 and 1.0 from UK, but you can get smaller values, you can get larger values than that. Okay, but here we have relatively simple uh, equation for friction, kinetic friction, 
It's just some constant of proportionality mu k, coefficient of kinetic friction, times the normal force. Okay, so static friction, it can be much more difficult to deal with than kinetic friction and far less intuitive than kinetic friction. So you see an object in motion with respect to another one, you know which way the kinetic friction force acts, you know what kind of friction it is. Static friction is a little trickier. Okay, so now we'll just go back with our book at rest. So we have our simple free body diagram with a normal force opposed by mg. Okay, the forces are in balance. Book's just sitting there. No reason for it to go left or right, so we don't need any friction. Okay, so now we're going to push on this book to the right. Okay, and the friction force, the static force of friction, basically keeps the book at rest. Okay, so everything has to balance in this picture. The upward forces cancel each other out. And the horizontal, the, sorry, the vertical forces cancel each other out, Fn equals mg, and the horizontal forces also have to cancel. So your force F to the right has to be exactly balanced by the static friction force acting to the left. If we take our force away, we stop pushing, then there's no reason for the uh, table to exert a friction force. Nothing to oppose here. Okay. So the static friction force acts in the direction that opposes the motion that would occur if there was no friction. Okay, so now let's say we apply a bigger force. Okay, we keep increasing our force, keep increasing our force, and the static friction keeps increasing, keeps increasing, matching the force we apply. But you can only do this up to a point. Okay, so we can pretty much increase our force to whatever we want, say. But the table has a maximum possible force of static friction that it can exert. And if our force overcomes the maximum possible force of static friction, then the book will start to slide. And then we're over to kinetic friction in that case. Okay. So here we have an equation for the maximum possible force of static friction. That's the coefficient of static friction mu s times the normal force. Okay, so here's the coefficient of static friction mu s. And in general, mu s is greater than or equal to, generally greater than, the coefficient of kinetic friction mu k. So it's harder to start something moving than it is to keep it going once it is moving. So Fs, Fs, Fs max is generally bigger than Fk because mu s is generally bigger than mu k. Okay, so once you overcome the force of static friction, then it starts to move, and then in fact you need less force to keep it going than you did to get it going in the first place. Now, in general, Fs is not equal to mu s Fn. It's just Fs max that's equal to mu s Fn. So Fs is less than or equal to mu s Fn. So that makes static friction a little harder to deal with than kinetic friction, where you simply have Fk equals mu k Fn all the time. So we'll often deal with what we call the limiting case when you're at the maximum possible value. Okay. But usually, this will be indicated in this scenario. For instance, let's say the question reads, you apply the maximum possible force to the right on a book before the book moves. Okay, So then you know that if you're applying maximum force to the right, then you've got to be dealing with the maximum possible force of static friction. But we can certainly find cases, and we'll deal with them, where Fs is less than mu s times Fn. So don't just blindly write down Fs equals mu s Fn all the time, because we can easily find a case where we just turn down our force that we apply to the book, and so static friction force goes down, it just has to match us. So it's very easy to find a case where Fs is less than the maximum possible value. 
Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about is how contact area affects friction. Okay, so let's take an example where we have a particular box rests on the bottom surface and turns out that we have to exert a force of 12 newtons horizontally to get it to move. Okay, so that means 12 newtons is going to be the maximum possible force of static friction. Now we turn the box over to rest on its side. Now the side has a smaller area than the bottom. Okay, so there's less area of the box in contact with the surface. So what do you think? The force that you have to exert to move the box is more than 12 newtons now with a smaller area, about 12 newtons still, or smaller than 12 newtons. So in our simple model, all that matters is really the types of surfaces that are in contact. Let's say we have now cardboard on wood or something. Well, we still have cardboard on wood when we turn the box over on its side. So we really don't change the coefficient. And we still have the same normal force because the normal force has to balance mg. And mg of the box is the same no matter which way the box is, is uh, resting. So based on our simple model, force of friction doesn't change. Well, how do we understand that? Okay. So let's get out our microscopes and we'll sort of view these uh, surfaces in, that are in contact with each other. So we might see a relatively smooth uh, bottom of the box in contact with a relatively smooth tabletop. But when you get out your microscope, you realize that, well, these surfaces are actually rather bumpy. And they actually only make contact with each other at a very small number of places. Okay? And if we try to slide one thing past each other, then these high points on each one get caught on one another, and that's what where the friction comes from. Okay, so what happens if we tilt the box, turn the box over, and uh, try and do this again? Okay, you would think, well, you'd have fewer places making contact, and maybe it'd be easier to slide. Maybe you'd think that. So, what happens here? So the normal force is still the same, but something's got to change about this interaction, right? So what happens is that if you decrease the area with the same force, with a decreased area, you have an increase in what we call pressure. Now we're going to get into pressure much more deeply in a few weeks when we do fluids, but pressure is force divided by area. So we have the same force over a smaller area that increases the pressure. So what this does is that you've got a smaller surface area in contact, but then the surfaces are going to be closer together because of this higher pressure. So these effects roughly balance. Okay, so you're pushing the surfaces closer together. So then you get sort of more high spots on one thing, uh, matching up with uh, or getting in the way of high spots on the other thing as they try to slide across each other. Okay, so more per unit area that is, and that these things roughly balance. In fact, you've decreased the area, but increased the pressure, decreased the distance between the surfaces in effect. So these effects roughly balance, and that keeps the force of friction about the same. Now this is a pretty simplistic view of friction. Friction actually is way more complicated than, uh, than what we just talked about. But uh, in fact, it's so complicated, we're just going to say, hey, ignore all these complications. We're going to treat it as a relatively simple thing, just uh, proportional to the normal force with a fixed coefficient of friction, depending on the types of services we have. Okay, so it is good to keep it in the back of your mind. This is a relatively simple model. It will not account for every single scenario, okay? But for the situations we'll deal with, we can actually get a lot of mileage out of this fairly simple model. Okay, so that's about it for our introduction to friction.